Please bow your heads for our prayer for illumination. God, we trust that you have our best interests at heart. As we hear the reading of your word, remind us that we have been raised with Christ and inspire us to seek the things that are above. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. Our first reading is from Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. That's on page 842 in the Old Testament section if you would like to follow along. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the most high they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord, who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, and that's on page 201 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient, these are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Our gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, and that's on page 74. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, 
and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. There are various themes that emerge week after week in the lectionary. One of the themes in the last several months, sorry, my microphone and I don't seem to be getting along, so. The, um, the theme of what does the voice of God sound like is one that has emerged this summer. And part of what just happened as Ward acted out God's voice in the parable that Jesus told is, is good. I want to encourage Ward and I want to encourage you in trying to picture what would that be like. And in particular, I want you to think about what God says. Now, the, um, the psalm on the bulletin cover this morning has, in its very first verse, reference to the steadfast love of the Lord. And again, in the very last verse, this is the psalm for today. And part of what God says when God speaks, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, is picked up very well here, this last verse of the psalm. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. The Hebrew word that is translated steadfast love is the word kesed, which simply has a letter that looks like an H, an S, and a D. There's some vowels added later. Chesed is translated most often as steadfast love or sometimes as mercy. And when God speaks, God refers to God's self as being filled with steadfast love. The best example of all is in the Ten Commandments story. You remember the Ten Commandments first are described and then some corollaries to them. But then it describes Moses on the mountaintop and when he comes down from the mountain, he sees that the people of God are worshiping a golden calf. And so he literally threw down the first set of tablets. They broke. The people had broken the understanding, the covenant, and so Moses broke the doggone tablets. Well, then God called him back up to the mountain and they did it again. And on the second time up, God is with Moses alone. And part of what the story around the Ten Commandments conveys is the idea that God really wants us to know God. And so literally what it says there is the Lord passed before him, passed before Moses, and proclaimed this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So if you grew up with a red letter Bible where the words of Jesus were in red, you maybe learned from that. But how do we mark the word of the Lord, the, the words that God speaks directly? And how do you picture the first one writing that down? How did Moses receive those? What did he hear? And now here as we look at the psalm, what did the psalmist feel drawn to that spoke in terms of steadfast love, chesed? I've often told you that when I am preparing a worship service, I choose a prayer of confession that is meant to be the question that the sermon answers. And the prayer of confession this morning, the middle line in that prayer says, we do not always follow your call. We turn away from you and go our own way. What does the Lord do about that? And what does the steadfast love of the Lord have to do with all of that? The three scriptures this morning, in effect, come at the question three different ways. 
of how do we understand the steadfast love of the Lord. We start with the prophet Hosea, 750 years before the time of Jesus, roughly. The lectionary this summer is also giving us these prophets in chronological order. They're not in the order of the books of the Bible, but we met Amos, and now we're on to Hosea, and next it'll be Isaiah. And they were all in that same period of time. Last week, I really appreciate Sophie Williams being the liturgist and wrestling with the hard piece of what Hosea was asked to do. Other prophets, for example, Amos, were given the word of the Lord to speak. And the word was usually, you did not follow God's covenant. You've turned away from God. So straighten up. That would be the word of the Lord. But by the time we get to Hosea, the Lord has decided he wants a prophet who's going to act out what God is feeling. One of the great metaphors in the Old Testament for the covenant relationship between God and God's people is the metaphor of marriage. God feels like he's married to a spouse who is not faithful. And so he says to Hosea, I want you to act that out. So poor Hosea has to marry this woman he knows is not going to stay faithful. And then they have children and they give them these odd names. These names which are meant to remind people when Hosea and Gomer call them home for dinner. Remind people of the embarrassments of turning away from God. But today's reading is at the other end of the prophet Hosea. And part of what we find is Hosea recording God's words as God is kind of wrestling internally. My people have turned away. They deserve punishment. But what am I really going to do? Now, all of us who have been parents know that experience. We've experienced the feeling of, okay, some tough love would be appropriate right now. But especially the love part. And we wrestle with that. So for the Old Testament to picture God, just like us, wrestling with what's going to yield the right result. And so in the Hosea passage, God says, My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, another word for Israel. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. There's the key. I know what we would do, how we would respond in anger, and yet God says, but I am God and no mortal. God has a better way. I had a friend years ago who told about a time when he was in seminary, and one of his assignments was to go to a, a court and to be both an observer and kind of a chaplain to this court. And like most of us, he had watched a lot of television and, you know, Law and Order or other crime dramas where there's this big dramatic sense of maybe they're innocent, maybe they're guilty. And he expected that as he went to the court to observe. But what he found in the particular court where he was an observer is that by the time they got to trial, frankly, most of these people, in fact, all of these people were guilty. And there was really no big drama about whether they would be found innocent or guilty. They were guilty. But there was drama. What was the drama? Well, the drama was which judge was sitting on the bench. There were some judges that just brought the wrath of the legal system down upon the one who was guilty, by the way. But there were other judges who saw a glimmer of hope or tried to do something that would move toward forgiveness. Well, Hosea tells the people, tells the story of God's people being put in court, but they got God as their judge. We're all guilty, but the Lord offers forgiveness. All the way back in the time of Hosea and certainly in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So first we consider the amazing grace of God, grace that we do not deserve. Then we move to the Colossians reading. The Colossians passage says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. One of the most beautiful themes in Paul's writing 
is the idea that we have died to sin and we are given new life. We are born again in Jesus Christ. The steadfast love of the Lord, which the Old Testament writers described as central to knowing God, came into sharp focus in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice how the Colossians passage began. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. The passage explores the whole drama of what it is to die in Christ and to be risen in a new life into the steadfast love of the Lord. The gospel message is that in Jesus Christ, we don't spend our lives fretting about God's judgment and the ways in which by sin we separate ourselves from God. Throughout this chapter, Paul invokes the metaphor of putting on clothing as with the choice of what to wear, what you chose to wear this morning, or when I chose to put this robe on. We're expressing something very specific. Paul writes that you have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. To grow in faith in Jesus Christ is to restore that part of the creation story that we were created in the image of God. We have found ways to move away from that, and yet God, in Jesus Christ, restores us to the image that God intends. In Hosea, the Lord is defined by amazing grace. In Colossians, we're called to clothe ourselves with this new self, this resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're called to be out from under the shadow of fear. Our lives of faith are not about what becomes of us beyond the grave but how Jesus Christ gives us new life to accomplish God's purpose in this life. And then finally, we add the gospel story. Jesus was teaching, was interrupted by one in the crowd. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Well, Jesus refuses to get sucked into the middle of a family argument. Instead, he tells a parable which affects us all. Not only the brothers dividing the inheritance. The point of the parable, as Ward shared with the children, is the danger of greed. It's wrong, I'm sorry, is it wrong that the farmer had a bumper crop and is experiencing prosperity? Not at all. But it is the steadfast love of the Lord which gave him that prosperity. What should he do? Well, you remember the Old Testament story of the manna in the wilderness? and the rules that came with this gift. They were not to set some aside, they were to trust that it would be there again tomorrow and the day after. And it was hard for God's people, but they finally got the hang of it. And we're still getting the hang of it. Here the parable Jesus told is making a similar point. Trust in God. Trust in the steadfast love of God. That's going to feed you this day. The steadfast love of the Lord will feed you throughout your life. The Lord's abundance calls upon us to love one another, not to keep it all ourselves. So three scriptures. The first, God is the judge and God is known by steadfast love. Secondly, in Jesus Christ, the steadfast love of the Lord becomes our nature as we clothe ourselves in Christ. And finally, to trust in God is to see the events of our lives in the light of the presence of God. So back to the final words on the bulletin cover. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Right now, it feels like we're in the midst of a nightmare of terror. There's almost a constant drumbeat of mass killings around the world and close at home. It sets us on edge. We're afraid. What should we do? The abhorrent evil of terrorists and extremists shakes the very foundation of who we are and where we turn for help. In the past two weeks, amidst the bluster of conventions, the message has been nearly constant that there is this choice, that there is that choice, and you're going to tip the balance with your vote. 
But the word of the Lord brings another truth into focus. From the earliest covenants of the Hebrew Scriptures to the new covenant in Jesus Christ, we are called upon to consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Our choice is to be transformed by the nature of God who loves us. And that choice makes all the difference. To come to worship is to lift up our hearts, to allow God's presence, God's purpose, God's will to become again the guiding light, the lamp to our path. In the darkest moments of their lives, the ones from whom we have received the inheritance of faith, considered the chesed, the steadfast love of the Lord. As we put on the clothing of faith in Jesus Christ and trust in God throughout our lives, the Lord will see us through. Let us pray. Loving God, you are always with us. Help us to be aware, to acknowledge, to sense, to hear, to feel, to know. And knowing, help us to go out as your servants, as your beloved, as those sent to spread the good news in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.